All right, so the time is now uh, four o'clock, so we're scheduled to begin. Um, so as you might have noticed, I'm not your usual host today. I'm uh, filling in for the for the week. Um, so yeah, I introduce myself. I, I'm Max, I'm a pure mathematician, uh, and I'm focusing on functional analysis for my PhD thesis, which uh, hopefully I'm about to finish. Uh, and in particular, I focus on uh, bounded operators on Banach spaces. Um, and I've been part of the Homotopic Minds course uh, to transition into an industry. And that's how I got into Saiku Group. Yeah, Saiku Group. And um, yeah, in particular, I've been really interested in uh, quantum computing and machine learning. And um, so I've also been uh, one of the mathematical mentors for the quantum formalism community projects, including this particular team uh, solution to the hackathon challenge. Uh, which they are presenting today. So the speakers today are Jamila Inan, who comes from Morocco and is doing a PhD in quantum AI. Also, we have uh, Mohammed Al Zafar Khan, who is based in South Africa and is doing a postdoc in uh, various machine learning topics. Uh, together, they formed a team for the Quantum Formalism Hackathon Challenge, where they were researching encoding classical genomic data into quantum states and uh yeah today they're gonna share what they uh found out during the uh the process um so i'm gonna be monitoring the chat to see if you guys have got any questions um so also there's going to be a discussion at the end where we will uh that you can ask anything else as well so uh without further ado i'm going to uh hide my uh microphone and pass you over to the speakers Thank you, Max. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Nuhaila, and uh, me and my friend, Dr. Mohammed, we will talk today about the classical to quantum sequence encoding in genomics. So, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this presentation will cover three main areas uh, existing quantum data encoding, uh, new quantum data encoding methods, and of course, a conclusion and future work section. So firstly, we will briefly touch upon existing quantum data encoding methods. Next, we will move on the new one, focusing on the three approaches. The first approach will be looseless compression inspired encoding schemes, uh, which aims to reduce the encoded data size without losing any information. The second approach is uh, entropy based methods, which utilize entropy calculation to encode the quantum data. Lastly, we will, we will discuss energy-based methods for testing encoded sequences, which use like the energy, uh, energy measurement to evaluate the quality of the encoded sequences. And finally, we will summarize our finding and suggest possible future work in the field. So we will start um, by introducing the quantum machine learning. So it is an a uh, research area that explores the interplay of ideas from quantum uh, computing and the machine learning. Of course, machine learning is the art and science of making computers learn from data how to solve problems instead of being explicitly programmed. Uh, quantum computing, as you know, like is a description of how information is processed on a special type of machines uh, based on the laws of quantum mechanics. So quantum machine learning is the intersection of these two fields, which has two goals. Like we can use the mathematical techniques uh, to solve the problems of quantum mechanics and improve the existing machine learning models and algorithms, or use the classical machine learning uh, to analyze data from quantum experiments. And we have like, for representation here is for the classical machine learning or we have each like a classical data and quantum devices but like the real representation of the quantum machine learning when we have the quantum data and quantum devices we will focus more in this presentation about the, this process of to convert the classical data to quantum data so uh, a quantum machine learning model 
looks like the circuits. First, we prepare the inner cellular state. Then we encode the data, means the way to encode classical or into the quantum states or qubits in order to be processed by the quantum circuits. Uh, however, techniques to accomplish this is still an open problem. So there is no generic encoding method addressing all types of problem data. And the encoding method depends very much on the problem needing to multiple data encoding. Then we have the unitary transformation to do the task of the model. Like, for example, we can, uh, in the variation circuits, we call this the parameterized circuits or ansatz. And to choose a good ansatz, we need to consider some factors like uh, the expressibility in entanglement. Then we measure our output. So in this presentation, we will focus more on the data encoding part, especially for the genomic data, the DNA sequences. So here is just a preview of the methods that we used for the existing methods. We have the implicit encoding, feature map encoding. We have like two using the double Z feature map using Qiskit and IQPE embedding for penilane. For the novel algorithms, we have the lossless compression inspired encoding schemes. We have two algorithms, the valves inspired encoding schemes one energy-based methods one and for the entropy-based methods we have like four oh. encoding based on the loss entropy encoding based on difference data and information geometry methods so we have a total 10 algorithms we'll discuss each one starting with the existing existing methods so Implicit encoding. So implicit encoding involves mapping classical data into quant qubits, a quantum state, through a series of controlled rotation to define the amplitude of the quantum state. This technique can handle nonlinear data distribution, and it's very helpful for various tasks, including classification, regression, and casting. So as you see here in the algorithm, the algorithm takes as inputs the dimensional classical data, a, Q, a number of qubits, a set of vector represent the classical samples. So the input vector is first padded with zero features as necessary to create a vector of dim dimension to n, and then normalize to ensure uh, that uh, implicit slice in the range of zero one, the algorithm then iterates over each qubit and each classical sample to calculate the rotation angle beta based on the amplitude of the original state and uh, the associated vector. So we have the rotation get is then applied to each qubit. And finally, we get the encoded state. So for example, uh, using the amplitude encoding, encoding to map the DNA sequence. Sorry, I keep hearing my voice. Keep hearing my voice. Yeah, uh, as I yeah. said here, uh, it's an example of using the implicit encoding to encode the DNA uh, sequence. Here, it's just E. So, first we need to represent the this DNA sequence uh, using a two-bit string here is string e two double zero, and the resulting quantum state is a superposition of all possible combination of these bases. So, as shown in the amplitude of the quantum states are here in the matrix are very small, which is expected given the small number of qubits involved. Like we have two, so. Here, the first element in the first row represent the probability of amplitude for the zero state, uh, double zero, uh, here, zero one, one zero, and one one. The output of uh, uh, quantum, this quantum state was also visualized using the Hanson diagram. It's from the Kiskit visualizer, which represents uh, the 
two states as a two dimension matrix where the size and the color of each square correspond to the magnitude and phase of the amplitude of that state. Now we have the Pauli feature map encoding. It involves applying repeated sequences of Hadamard and Pauli gates to an initially prepared quantum system with the Pauli gates acting as a set of nonlinear functions of the input data. There are several variations of the Pauli feature map, such as the WZ feature map and IQP embedding, which can provide different trade-offs between expressiveness and efficiency for different applications. So the algorithm uh, takes as input a number of qubits uh, that, uh, yeah, input vector of length n and the maximum size of the subsets p. <laughs> Uh, the algorithm initializes a quantum circuit with the n qubits and applies a layer of Hadamard gate to all qubits for each subset C, C, uh, sorry, S. Yeah, uh, the, the algorithm applies a, a poly gate P to each qubit in S, then applies a controlled uh, Z gate between every pair of qubits. It applies a nonlinear function of the form uh, phi to each qubit in S. So finally, the algorithm applies another layer of Hadamard gate to all qubits, and we obtain the encoded state. And as I mentioned, there are two specific. There is a lot of specific, uh, like examples to use this uh, this poly feature map encoding. But in our work, we focus on the on two, like the double Z feature map and I keep embedding from Penelain. So the difference is that the nonlinear function phi is a simple embedding of the input vector into the amplitude of the qubits for the double Z feature map. And for, and for uh, Penelain, the non, uh, the non this, this function is a more complex feature map that involves applying a series of signal gates and a single qubit. Uh, rotation to the qubit. So after applying these methods, we get these results. Uh, for the double Z feature map, we get this quantum state vector by executing the circuits on our simulation backend, custom simulator. <coughs> Sorry. We also have this representing using plot CT as shown. Uh, we have this blue square on the second row of the second column, indicating that the probability of measuring the qubit is in the state zero is zero one, which represents the encoded data for the DNA sequence, e.g. Uh, yeah, on the right, we have like uh, the output, which is a set vector representing the quantum state of the DNA sequence uh, with different amplitude for each possible state for the state in a sequence EGC. We have also the block sphere representation for each qubit. We use it just for better visualization. See? As you know, the block sphere is used to represent the state of a single qubit and allows us for a straightforward interpretation of the quantum data. So we here represent the block sphere of each qubit in the final state and show that this DNA AGC sequence is converted to state 011, as you can see here also in the matrix. Now the lossless compression inspired encoding schemes. So as a motivation of this method, like they preserve the original DNA sequence without any information loss. It is important to note that even in neutrogenous bases, it is of this affect the entire DNA sequence and thus the organism as well. So this method allows us for presentation of more frequently occurring bases with shorter code. Also, the repeated sequences can be encoded to one sample, thus reducing the number of qubits required. This is especially important in the NISC era, where we have limited qubit to work with. 
So this facilitates the scalability because the real world genomics data is quite large. So these methods are quick to implement and efficient. And since uh, the lossless based compression algorithms offer the benefits of reducing the amount of data for preprocessing, these types of algorithms have the potential to reduce the amount of errors, thus seen as current quantum computing is highly error sensitive, as you know. So we will start with this one, quantum influenced Huffman encoding. So Huffman Coding is the, a data compression algorithm that assigns varying length codes to sample based on their frequency of occurrence in the input data. In the DNA encoding application, Hoffman coding can represent DNA sequence with a minimal number of qubits, which is particularly useful in quantum, quantum computing application. So the goal of this algorithm is to minimize the average length of the code they be reducing the amount of memory required to store the data. So it takes as input a DNA sequence and applies various classical operations to construct uh, a Huffman tree, uh, then assign binary codes to each sample, code the data into qubits. Then it gives us the encoded state and the total number of bits required to store this data. Consider, for example, this DNA sequence, which is commonly used in cloning and PCR testing. If I remember well, we called it the M13 bacteriophores sequence. So uh, we apply this encoding scheme to obtain uh, the encoded quantum state. We start by counting the nitrogenous as we have, like. Here we have two uh, double T and uh, it's five, sorry, it's five C and four G and seven E. So in, so in total it's 18. Thus we now uh, apply this binary encoding, convert these bits into qubits using like one zero for C and 1, 1 for E, 0, 1 for G, and double zero for T. And we get this as the encoded states of this DNA sequence. So in this algorithm, we observe that it, it has a time computational complexity of key steps. This means that Despite all the seemingly difficult operation, it scales linearly in time as the size of the input increases. Additionally, the algorithm calculates and returns the number of qubits required to encode the DNA sequence. Now we have another algorithm. I think if Dr. Mohammed is ready, he can continue. Are you here, Mohammed? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you for the excellent uh, first part of the of the presentation, and I shall try and take over uh, a bit here. So uh, before we go into the quantum uh, Barrow's Wheeler transform, let's uh, just quickly recap uh, what happened in the um, in the previous Huffman encoding scheme. So essentially, if you got uh, if you got like a code and uh, you want to uh, or you got something that you want to encode and uh, basically you have like repeated characters so you're gonna essentially you're gonna you, 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 you're gonna work out the frequency of each character so for for dna sequencing there we have uh, four different uh, types of uh, nitrogenous bases that makes up the dna molecule so you do a count of each and thereafter you do a uh, ordering so you 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 order from lowest to highest so you take the nitrogenous base with the lowest uh, count or the lowest lowest frequency you put it towards the extreme left and then you go in ascending order all the way to the extreme right and essentially that forms the base of your tree thereafter you assign the core for each um 
uh, arm of the tree or uh, for each branch of the tree rather you essentially if it lies towards the left you assign a code of zero to it and if it lies towards the right you assign a code of one to it and you basically you build up your tree until you get to the apex and then your code uh, basically you uh, you you extract or extrapolate your code from the diagram and uh, thereafter we do like a binary encoding and uh, we we create the quantum state now to go into the barrows wheeler transform um, just to explain uh, uh, in, a, in a high level uh, how it works uh, before we actually go through the algorithm. Uh, Nuela, can you maybe move to the next slide? Uh, sorry, uh, the one where I put the explanation. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Sorry, maybe go back. I don't know, after this, after this. Uh, slide 13, 14. Uh, yeah, after this, next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, basically, so this is the, the algorithm and this is uh, what you're trying to do. Right? So the first step of the algorithm is to take your, your DNA sequence. Uh, and then obviously we do things like initialization of uh, registers and states and things like that. But if you just look at the the classical Burroughs Wheeler transform, you take your um, you take your 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 DNA sequence that you want to encode, and uh, in the in the classical sense, some people put like a stopper variable that, uh, and I'll explain what the stopper variable does. So you do a cyclic uh, permutation, or and you do and then you like for example, if you have A B C D. Then you have your stopper. Then the first iteration would be to take your stopper and move it from the ball, from the right, extreme right to move it towards the left, and then that's that's your your next um, your your next uh, uh, your next encoded uh, or, or your next element. Then you you take the D and then you rotate the D. So then you'll have D stopper A B C and so on, and then you rotate like that in a cyclic pattern until you come back to the original form of the DNA sequence that you want to encode, and thereafter. What you try to do is you try to alphabetically arrange uh, this. So the stopper is given priority. So the stopper is counted as your first element. And thereafter, you do like an al alphabetical arrangement of the Latin uh, alphabet. So obviously, A would be first, B would be second, and so on and so forth. Um, and thereafter, what you try to do is you try to uh, assign uh, indexes uh, to the original DNA sequence, and then you do an extraction of the last, uh, of the last elements that lie on the extreme right. And upon doing that uh, extraction, you take uh, you, you take that extraction that you obtain, and then you take the index from the original sequence and you concatenate the two together. So that means you just basically place them together, those two. And basically, that was the that in a high level overview. That's the classical Barrow's Wheeler transform. So the quantum element comes now, where you uh, to that uh, classical part, you apply some kind of unitary transformation. So as Nuhila was explaining, uh, unitary transformation, uh, as we understand from linear algebra, is just an operator where if you multiply it by its uh, conjugate, uh, complex conjugate transpose, you get the identity matrix. So it's similar in quantum computing, except that we do this with, uh, with quantum gates. And effectively, that, uh, that, uh, once you apply this unitary transformation, you're going to get your encoded uh, quantum states. And what I just described to you is just the steps for which what the algorithm tries, tries to achieve. And then at the end of the algorithm, algorithm it returns its uh, the, the encoded uh, quantum state. Um, yeah. Um, can we maybe proceed to the to the next one? The next algorithm? Yeah. So the next one uh, for us was the cosine encoding scheme. And this was uh, inspired by wavelets in mathematics. So um, so essentially, uh, a wavelet, what it is, it's just a mathematical function, and they use it a lot in uh, signal processing uh, and basically to do conversions between time and frequency domains, uh, a lot uh, in electrical engineering and uh, modulation and things like that. So this algorithm, uh, it works uh, basically by using uh, co like the, the cosine transform. So how it works is uh, it's meant for image data. So all the algorithms so far you've seen is we feed direct um, sequences of the DNA. So maybe I, I'm not sure how the geneticists or, uh, do this, do it, but essentially they, they, they somehow obtain the DNA sequence and then they're going to feed it to these algorithms or feed it to a computer that runs these algorithms. But with this now we, we have snapshots or we have image data of the, of the DNA sequence. 
And uh, specifically, if you have an M by N dimensional uh, grayscale image, uh, obviously all the pixels are, have to be real. They represent uh, real intensities. And then what you do is, uh, for each row and for each column index, you're going to apply a discrete cosine transform. So the discrete cosine transform, uh, essentially, uh, it applies like uh, some kind of period. It takes a cosine of some kind of uh, periodically transformed uh, uh, index, uh, row and column index, and it normalizes it by half the co uh, half the coefficients, uh, and then it applies it to the to to the function. And those coefficients that it applies it uh, to, it's uh, it's defined uh, very similar to a to a Dirac delta function, except that it's uh, different. Uh, uh, it's different. Like when you multiply the coefficients out you get a different uh, number. So specifically, if the coefficients are bigger than zero, then you get one over root two. And if the, uh, uh, that represents uh, the cosine of pi over four, and if the coefficients are equal to one, then if the variable just uh, returns a value of one. So what you're gonna do is, after you work out the um, uh, discrete for a cosine transform for each pixel, you're gonna find the maximum value or the maximum, uh, uh, the pixel that returns a maximum value. And that maximum value is going to serve as your normalization constant. Then for each pixel along the uh, along the image, along the rows and the columns, what you're going to do is you're going to do a normalization of each of those. And then uh, for each element, you're going to do a mapping. So you're going to take uh, the, the absolute value of the normalized value of the, uh, of the frequency of the pixel, and you're going to map it uh, to some kind of uh, amplitude. And uh, that, that amplitude is a number between one and uh, the count or the cardinality uh, of the of the number of uh, frequencies that you 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 extracted, uh, and essentially once you have that, then you do a, a quantum Fourier transform, and a quantum Fourier transform is a standard operation in uh, quantum computing algorithms. And upon doing that, uh, you will have your encoded state. And what the algorithm tries to do is it tries to uh, take an, an m by n dimensional uh, image. And it returns uh, a two n dimensional data set uh, that lies in the Hilbert space together with the encoded state. Okay, um, maybe uh, I think switch to the to the next. Um, and obviously, we can see that there were two, two for loops uh, in that algorithm. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna note that it will have like a quadratic uh, uh, runtime. Uh, so. Basically, uh, I think that takes care of uh, those kind of in, uh, encoding schemes. Uh, I'll go through the entropy-based methods now, right? So with the entro entropy-based methods, we effectively, we have uh, three, uh, three types, right? So the one is you take the DNA sequence directly and you take uh, the number of qubits that you want to encode it into. And uh, the, first, the, the first algorithm that I will present, which is S-encode, uh, does the encoding directly. The second two, uh, which we call NZ22 and NZ23, uh, takes the DNA sequence that you have and then goes into a database of DNA sequences and it tries to do some kind of comparison to see how good the mapping is between the two. So specifically the, the S encode uh, algorithm, right? So as I explained, it takes in a DNA sequence and it takes in a number of qubits that, uh, you, that you want to encode it uh, to. Then, then what it does is you know, obviously you do an initialization of your quantum register for your N qubits. And then what it does is for each uh, nitrogenous base that lies in your DNA sequence, it calculates the probability of each base. So the probability of each base would be the number of occurrences of that base divided by the total length of the sequence. And thereafter, it calculates the inf information entropy. So, uh, we, so just to explain that quickly. So intro entropy, we know we encounter it in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics for the first time like in, the, in our lives when we hear about it. But there's also in information theory, there's an in information entropy. And specifically how it's defined is, it's defined as the, the probability of the base or the probability of your item times the log of one over the probability of that uh, base or that item. And it's log to base two. And uh, why log to base two? Because uh, in information, uh, there's basically an on state and an off state. So there's two bits of information. And uh, uh, so, so the information, the formula, that, that's what it tries to do. And then you get the negative sign that pops up in the front of the form, or formula. And that's from the, the log, the properties of the logarithm. So if you have log of one over something, it's equal to the negative log of, of that. Um, yeah, and effectively, that's what you do. Uh, and then what you do is once you, you got the log of your, of your number of uh, qubits, you're going to calculate these two hyperparameters called K and M. 
So specifically how they work is it takes the ceiling function uh, of the lobbed uh, to base two of your N and it takes an M, the other hyperparameter takes N and divides it by K and then takes the ceiling function of that. And then you're gonna apply some kind of fragmentation function. So what the frag fragmentation function does is it subdivides the DNA sequence uh, into M segments and each segment has the same fixed size and we call that size K such that when you take the union of each segmented or uh, subdivided uh, uh, piece of the DNA sequence, you get the original DNA sequence uh, back. Then um, what it tries to do is for each uh, segmented DNA sequence, you calculate the information entropy. Thereafter, you calculate the maximum entropy, which is essentially defined as the maximum value of all the entropies of all your uh, segments. So once you do this, that maximum entropy works as your normalization constant. Um, and what, what you do is, after for each uh, segment's entropy, you're going to normalize it, and then you're going to sort it from low to high. And that sorted uh, sequence, uh, we can give it a name, a special name, like maybe calligraphic H. Um, and then I'll tell you why that's important. Then for each DNA sequence uh, corresponding to that calligraphic H, what you're going to do is you're going to do a synthesis, uh, synthesis of your quantum state and how the synthesis of the quantum state works is it's going to take uh, it's going to apply a unitary transformation that's going to map your zero uh, zero state it's going to map it to uh, it's going to map it to the, the the corresponding quantum state with the tensor product of the zero state and that's just an arbitrary unitary transformation that we chose we thought that would work good for DNA sequencing but Essentially, you can try different types of unitary transformations and see which one give you an, gives you an optimal result. And then in order to create superposition of this, we apply a Hadamard transformation, and uh, basically that ends the algorithm. Then for each state that you're going to get, in order to get the total encoded state, you're going to take a tensor product over each state, and that's going to give you your encoded state of the entire DNA sequence. Now, um, to go further into the other algorithms, so we call the other algorithms, NZ22 and NZ23, they're very similar to each other, differing by uh, one kind of uh, entropy measure, and I'll, I'll explain both of them to you. Uh, so effectively now, you're going to take a DNA sequence and you're going to take a DNA sequence in memory or in, in a database that lies somewhere. Then you're going to calculate, uh, as we previously we've seen, you're going to calculate the probability of the base in your DNA sequence of each base in your DNA sequence, and you're going to calculate the probability of each base in your uh, reference DNA sequence or the DNA sequence that lies in your database somewhere. Then, in order to compare the two probability distributions, uh, specific, uh, to compare the entropy of two probability distributions in machine learning, the most common measure of doing that is the uh, kullback leibler divergence. And in the discrete sense, it's uh, very simple because we don't have to go into measure theory or anything. We can just easily just calculate it. So it's defined as the probability of your first probability distribution multiplied by the uh, uh, natural logarithm of the probability of your first uh, probability distribution divided by the probability of your second uh, probability distribution. Of course, the probability of your second probability distribution must not be uh, equal to zero because you, in, in, in the denominator you can't have zero. Then uh, well, what the, once you do this, you're going to calculate the number of qubits required. So then we introduce a hyperparameter alpha, which is a number between zero and one, adjustable, therefore hyperparameter, and it's effectively defined as alpha multiplied by the ceiling of your kullback leibler divergence. So if your KL divergence is a number like um, 0 0.3 or 0 0.618, so the obviously the ceiling of that would be one, and then you just require one qubit to do that encoding, and therefore. You thereafter you do a you do a mapping from your DNA sequence to your reference DNA sequence uh, in each uh, register, and effectively that returns your uh, encoded quantum state. Now uh, analogous to this, the NZ23 algorithm works the same, it's, but instead of using a kullback leibler divergence, it uses a something called a Bhattacharya divergence or a Bhattacharya uh, uh, distance, and the reason why we chose to use this kind of uh, a measure specifically in the context of um, genomics uh, because the, the pullback Leibler divergence, uh, it, it doesn't account for overlaps in DNA sequencing uh, or it overlaps in the sense of probability distribution. So it doesn't account for that. Secondly, uh, we found that the KL divergence is not uh, symmetric. Uh, so this means that the, the order of the respective probability distributions matters. 
because you can't have the log of the second probability distribution divided by the first. The order is log of the first divided by the second. And in uh, genomics, something like this could present a potential problem in a real world application. And uh, lastly, since uh, in, the, in the computational basis, the DNA sequencing, uh, like we know when we do encoding, it's either zero or one. And so it makes sense to have some kind of uh, divergence measurement uh, that has a range of zero and one. And for the KL divergence, it has a, a range of zero inclusive to infinity. But however, the Bhattacharya uh, divergence has a range from zero to one. Therefore, based on these three reasons, we thought that it was good to, uh, to have an algorithm that does encoding based on the Bhattacharya divergence. So how the divergence is defined, it's defined as log of one over the sum of the square root of the probability of the first distribution distribution multiplied by, multiplied by the probability of the second distribution. Uh, and basically, once you, you know how to work out that probability uh, measure, and also you know, we've uh, put code in the in the repo, uh, repository, so the, we got a piece of code that does all these calculations for you as well. So once you know that divergence measure, the steps are the same as NZ22, and basically you work out the number of qubits that you're going to require, and you also, and it returns the number of qubits, and uh, sorry, it returns the encoded state for you. Um, yeah. And then we move on to uh, information geometry methods. So, um, I'll, uh, so, so to, just to give some uh, context about uh, information geometry, uh, it's the amalgamation of two fields, differential geometry and information theory. And basically, it tries to take probability distributions, put them on on the, on manifolds, and we call these manifolds uh, specifically statistical manifolds. And it tries to study their properties. So uh, a manifold is just uh, is just is just a space that is uh, it's a continuous space that is locally Euclidean, and attached to that space we have some kind of metric. So a metric is a measurement on that space. Uh, so so, so there is a there's, I'm not a pure mathematician, but I know to, to my knowledge that the space doesn't have to be infinitely continuous and smooth and differentiable, but it has to be smooth and continuous and differentiable up to some point. So it has to be. Uh, a C gamma uh, manifold. Um, so, so how does the how does this work? So, basically, uh, to define a metric or a measurement uh, on your probability distribution, you're going to take your probability distribution over some kind of. Um, you're going to take your pro probability distribution uh, over your random variable, and you're going to take the um, gradient of your probability distribution. Uh, over some kind of high, uh, some kind of uh, param uh, parameterizations, and basically that gives you your 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 your, your metric. So uh, there's two common types of metrics that we could possibly use: the KL divergence, which I've just discussed before, and the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which also arises, and it's de uh, it's defined as uh, uh, similarly to how the it's defined using the kullback leave divergence. But I've also I'd also like to talk about a third. Uh, uh, kind of metric and how we go about defining it, uh, because one of the questions that Max posed to us upon review of the paper of the paper that you submitted was uh, how do you construct the the manifold. So I'll give you one example in terms of something called the Fisher Rao met, uh, metric. So the Fisher Rao metric is just defined uh, as the integral of the quarter of the log of the of the derivative of the log of the probability of the first probability distribution with respect to the second probability distribution. Right? And uh, effectively, how does uh, so, so so we know that this uh, this metric is uh, suitable because it satisfies various properties of metrics like positive definiteness, smoothness, uh, uh, symmetric bilinear forms, and things like that. And if effectively now, if you want to do a construction of this, uh, we firstly we, we consider the the probability space and how we go about constructing that space. Um, and the space is basically chosen based on the probability distribution that you have. Next, we, uh, we consider the tangent space or the derivative space. And the tangent space uh, is just it's calculated by essentially considering small perturbations of your probability distribution while keeping your normalization constant the same throughout the process. And then in the last step, uh, effectively what we're going to try and do is, uh, in order to calculate the metric itself, we take the inner product of the two, of two tangent vectors at each point on the manifold and effectively that will give us the final uh, piece that we need to construct our metric. Now, to go into the algorithm itself, we effectively got two DNA sequences, the one that you want to encode and the one that lies in the database somewhere, which we call the reference DNA sequence. Uh, each of them has the same size, right? 
So uh, what you do is, as previously with the other entropy algorithms, you're going to calculate the probability of each base. Then using the steps that I've described before, you're going to construct the information metric between the, those two, uh, two probability distributions. And once you construct the information metric, then you go about the process, you construct the tangent space, and then you take the inner product at each point on the manifold, uh, uh, at each point in the space, and thereafter you form your manifold. Thereafter, once you have your manifold, you're going to have to map it from the, you're going to have to map the manifold to a Hilbert space because we're working in quantum computing and in quantum, any space that you work with has to be a Hilbert space. So in order to do this, we create some kind of basis, which is maps the manifold M, uh, calligraphic M to calligraphic H. Thereafter, we apply some kind of linear operator. We just chose a random linear operator there, but um, it can be literally be any a linear operator that satisfies the properties of linear of linear operators. And uh, basically, for the one that we chose, once you have this, uh, you, you calculate your metric, and it's defined as the uh, basically taking your metric and uh, working out the outer product plus the sum of the points we are uh, of the sum on the manifold of your metric where the points are not the same. And then after to construct your quantum state. You uh, take one over the square root of your linear operator, you multiply it by your metric, and then you multiply it by the uh, one over the square root of your linear operator once again, and then you multiply it by your basis state, your zero. And effectively, this gives you your encoded um, your encoded uh, state. Uh, maybe I should have said at the beginning while explaining these um, these metrics that these are all um, experimental. Meaning that uh, these algorithms are things that we designed uh, not uh, with the intention of publication, but also with the intention that uh, we are just doing this uh, for the first time, and we are not uh, convinced that uh, these may potentially be uh, there's uh, algorithms that work. So it's open to criticism, it's open to peer review, and we welcome that. Um, and then lastly, we'll move on to the last uh, algorithm, which is based on energy methods. So this is inspired by um, uh, so by statistical mechanics, and uh, specifically, uh, we're going to work with the Boltzmann machine. So the Boltzmann machine is just uh, it's a machine learning method that tries to uh, it, it's used basically in unsupervised machine learning tasks uh, like dimensionality reduction, data generation. So and it's also like pattern recognition, and uh, and specifically we type uh, we term this type of learning as stochastic learning theory. Right? And there's two, uh, from statistical mechanics, uh, we adopt two, uh, two important uh, concepts. So first is the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, mathematicians, I think uh, they also call it the Gibbs distribution. Uh, and also we uh, adopt something called the partition function. So now how does, uh, how does this work, right? So the Boltzmann machine, uh, effectively there's uh, two types, right? There's the restricted Boltzmann machine and there's the deep uh, belief network. So I don't want to go into the theory of this, but effectively how they uh, differ is based on the arrangement of the hidden layers and the visible layers, right? And our algorithm, the, which we term calls, it effectively takes in a DNA sequence, right? Then it takes in some, uh, it tries to initialize some kind of circuit parameters. So uh, these are hyperparameters, they are tunable and it, they can be changed uh, to, to, to obtain optimal uh, performance. And then we also uh, initialize some kind of weights and biases, right? So the weights, you know, that these are uh, trainable, that th these are things that we try to learn and the biases are the constants. So if you have like a Y equals MX plus C, C will be your bias, right? Now for each nitrogenous base in your DNA sequence, you're gonna apply some kind of binary encoding scheme, uh, sorry, you're gonna apply some kind of uh, binary encoding scheme. Uh, and what these are gonna try and do is, uh, they're gonna try and uh, convert these DNA sequences into binary numbers, right? Thereafter, you're going to calculate the number of segments that you want to split in, uh, into. Uh, the, this as well is a hyperparameter, and you're going to calculate the number of varieties that you want to split it into. So you calculate the number of segments and the length of each segment. So that's what the variety does. Now, following arises, if the cardinality, meaning the, the length of the DNA sequence is not zero, so it means you don't feed the machine an empty DNA sequence, what you're going to do is, if uh, the, the length is even, then the number of um, the number of segments that you divide it into is just the cardinality divided by the number of varieties. Now, if the if the length of the DNA sequence is odd, then it's the floor of the cardinality or of the of the length of your DNA sequence minus one divided by the number of varieties, right? And uh, so those two things occur. So once you get your value of n, 
uh, why it's important now, because for the next part of the algorithm, now for each nitrogenous base in that N that happens, you can apply a quantum encoding. So quantum encoding simply means in this context, you take your zero and you map it to a zero ket. You take your one and you map your one to a one ket. Now you're going to repeat the following steps until your loss function is very close to zero, right? Or it's, or it's zero in the ideal case, but in real world data, it's not exactly zero, but we're going to try and get as close to zero as possible. Now you're going to split your encoded states into training and validation sets. Thereafter, you're going to do a mini batch sampling of your encoded states and you're going to calculate your energy. So there's a very uh, mathematical and very difficult formula that uh, you can re read the algorithm and uh, you, you can uh, look at the formula for yourself or you can find it in any uh, machine learning textbook or statistical mechanics textbook. Thereafter, you're going to calculate the partition function. Now, in the context of uh, uh, quantum computing, the partition function is defined as the exponential of the negative of your encoded quantum state. Right? And once you calculate your partition function, you're going to calculate your cost function. So your cost function is defined as one negative one over the length of your DNA sequence uh, mul uh, multiplied by the sum over all states of the log of one over your partition function uh, multiplied by the exponential of, your ne of the negative of your energy. So it essentially tries to normalize your energy uh, based, uh, based on the partition function. And uh, once you do this, you're going to repeat these steps until you you have uh, your, co your your cost function going uh, clo as close to zero as possible. Now, in order to do that, you'll have to learn the optimal values of the weights. So in order to learn the opt optimal value or, uh, values of the weights, you're going to have to do gradient descent or any variation of gradient descent, like stochastic gradient descent, or add a grad, add a delta, uh, RMS prop, and so on and so forth. But the point is, you do some kind of uh, scheme in which you try to learn your weights. And once you do this, uh, it's going to return your encoded states. The uh, versatility of this algorithm, uh, what Noela discovered was, it's not only used for testing, um, for testing whether uh, how good an encoding scheme is, but it can also be used for encoding itself. Um, and I think, yeah, that's uh, I'll stop there because I think that's the end of the algorithms. Uh, Noela, you want to discuss the conclusion? Yeah, sorry, I need to see this. So, as a conclusion, we have developed new algorithms for classical uh, to quantum data encoding in bioinformatics, especially genetics data, by employing various quantum computing techniques as we represent. Also, we have, the, we have demonstrated the efficacy of proposed algorithms such as the quantum Huffman, the key BWT cosine encoding, and async code, codes in producing the encoded quantum state. Further testing and validation are needed to assess the effectiveness in larger data sets and real world scenarios. Like we present some results, but to, to understand and to test these results, we need to do some uh, tasks like prediction of the DNA sequence or classification. So, uh, also, the study provides us promising avenues for the development of bioinformatics applications based on quantum computing. As a future work, we will try to investigate the performance of the proposed algorithms on larger data sets and compare them with the existing methods, uh, test the algorithms on real quantum hardware uh, to evaluate the performance and effectiveness in practical applications, like I said, prediction or classification of the DNA sequences, uh, explore the potential of the quantum computing for other bioinformatics tasks such as the protein folding prediction or drug discovery using our algorithms. Uh, examine uh, the limitation and challenge of the proposed methods, such as the impact of noise on the encoding and algorithm scalability. And contribute, of course, to the advances of bioinformatics application of quantum computing. And thank you for your attention. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, does anyone have any questions for the speakers? Um, I had one to get started. Uh, so these, there's lots of different types of encoding uh, algorithms you can use, like as you discussed, and they all have their pros and cons and are probably better suited to, to some data sets than others. Um, to, to my eye, like uh, the DNA data set, like it looks kind of close to uniformly random between the, the letters and it's an alphabet of only four letters, um, which gives it a specific uh, kind of like uh, form, uh, which intuitively of these algorithms do you think is best suited for those? Um, um, I can try and take this. Uh, so, uh, so so we, we haven't uh, tested which is the most performing or well, best performing. We've shown a couple of the algorithms, they run uh, linear in time. So that means as the size of the DNA sequence that you feed into the computer increases, it scales linearly. So that's a uh, positive. But we've also shown that um, the Qualtz algorithm based on quantum Boltzmann machines is more universal. So whereas some algorithms can only do encoding, Qualtz can do encoding. And you can also take an encoded sequence, you can feed it an encoded sequence, and it can tell you how close to a reference DNA sequence that uh, you, you want to encode it. So for example, if you have the, I don't know, COVID-19, uh, maybe I'm talking nonsense, but if you have the COVID-19 DNA sequence and you're in, 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 in a database, you know somewhere that this is the actual, uh, this is the, 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 the DNA sequence for COVID-19. Now you want to test like, some, con some kind of uh, variation of the, of the strain. So you can feed it and you can give you spit out a probability of how close they are matched together. So what if it's uh, if it's the same strain of COVID, if it's a new strain, it'll give a probably a different probability. So I think uh, we, we can't answer that question directly, but we can say that some algorithms are, uh, the, the, their runtime is O of N and some algorithms, uh, they are more universal than the others. Yeah, also like some of the algorithms can uh, uh, deal with large data like uh, in the coding or for different algorithms like if we used a long DNA sequence the code doesn't work and doesn't give us good results so it depends like we still need to uh, work on application to see yeah I guess that's uh, especially important for NISC hardware tasks right yeah yeah. Also, right. we've seen one of the algorithms where uh, most of the algorithms they require you to feed a DNA sequence uh, to the computer, but we have one that uh, effectively you can take images of the DNA sequence. So it tries to work with image data, like a, mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it a convolutional neural network, but uh, it's similar like principles of it try to work with image data. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Berend in the chat. He says, uh, which of these algorithms has the best potential to scale up? Uh, scale up in terms of being deployed and used in the real world? OK. Uh... I guess it will depend on the application, like if the model. like. It a larger number of quantum compute. So we would say like uh, one of the algorithms that require uh -huh. less number of qubits because of the NISC era computing that we're in now. So we don't have a lot of qubits to work with and we don't have access to a lot of qubits. So we would choose an algorithm for the NISC era that's the least number of qubits. And that would depend on the length of your DNA sequence that uh, you feed. And it will also depend on how the encoding is done. Yeah, and for uh, his question, like uh, the quantum Hoffman coding used like uh, there was a few qubits, so maybe it will be the best spot also to scale up. But it depends on the application, like and also on the the DNA sequence, like because we encode our DNA, uh, like uh, we use the number of qubits based on the DNA uh, sequence length, so it depends. 
Yeah, we, we have a working code of, uh, we, we took, uh, we, we looked online for, uh, for a real DNA sequence and we wrote some Python code that where you feed the DNA sequence to the quantum Hoffman encoding and it returns uh, an encoded state for you. So um, if you guys can check that out uh, in, in the GitHub uh, repo. So I think uh, that I would go with that one because the idea is so simple, Hoffman encoding and uh, the code, we, we were able to write the code uh, as non-experts. So, of course, these things are subject to like uh, a bioinformatics uh, expert, like reviewing them and, and, and things like that. But uh, well, yeah, think, we um, want to work more on it. And, one of uh, the things which uh, I did think about when, um, when you are talking about some of the classical uh, encoding schemes uh, that, the, that you can be changed into quantum, like the Burroughs uh, Wheeler and the Huffman encoding is that you could do a combination of both of those, right? They're not like exclusive from each other. Um, have you thought about that, doing that kind of thing? Uh, I haven't personally, but I think we, you can be our new collaborator and we can explore this. Yeah, that will be a great idea, like combining the two. We should try this. Okay, uh, is there any more questions before we before we finish up? Um, in that case, I, I'd like to thank the speakers again. And um, yeah, I hope everyone has a, a good weekend. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone and thank you for attending and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you, Max, for hosting us. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.